Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer of space. space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. You Have to Go Out, written by Stone Stalls Beatles. I once had the misfortune of being rescued by the Growl. My ship was on her last legs. I brought her 30 cycles used, and the reactor made an awful din whenever we cranked it beyond idle. Still, we plied the gullet, bidding as low as any of the rest of the independent outfits who couldn't afford a big, new, fuel-hungry nebula like all the corporate lines could. My crew, on their meager rations, I'd bid too low for the contract hauling volatiles, prayed to every star along the way that the reactor wouldn't melt down. On the far side of the system, the reactor went supercritical. A few moments later, it decided to ingest the whole coolant pump assembly after guzzling the last of the reserve coolant. With power spiking, I ordered my people to abandon ship. There was no use sticking around when it melted through its containment and poked the cargo hold packed with explosives. An ugly growl frigate lurked around for pirates, answered the distress call from our little lifeboat. They beamed wolfish grins at us as they pulled us aboard. There was no concerns for all our well-being after we just escaped an exploding freighter with our tails and tentacles singed. They had only one thing to say to us. Pay up. I paid them handsomely for their services rendered. It was certainly more money than they ever got from capturing pirates' prices. That was the law of the gunnet. If you wanted someone to go out of their way to help you, you'd have to pay up. The rescue wiped out what little I had left after buying the old rust bucket, and then some. I had to borrow some money from a Talari loan shop just to make sure that the growl didn't hunt me down across the station and repossess the life that they'd saved. I took a job as a crewman aboard a little ship called Featherweight, which flew like a ton of bricks. No longer able to afford a captain's chair and eager to free my new creditor. Lucky for me... The featherweight only saw the gullet once or twice a cycle. She operated where the corporate lines deemed it was too unprofitable to go. The alley. If you thought the magnetic storms in the gullet were bad, try the alley. Featherweight spent more money on replacing fry computer chips than fuel. She had money to burn, bidding reasonable sums on contracts, a consequence of a slim competition. Of course, competition was slim for good reason. The Alio Pulsars is where spaces go to die. We all knew that one bad storm wouldn't just fry one of the three redundant computers. A real monster could shred the drive to bits without any warning. Even if by some miracle the ship stayed in one piece, no drive would mean no FTL travel or communication. A hundred years of radio waves from the nearest hint of civilization, the ship would drift along without hope. It would become the cruise too well before the rations ever ran out. A perfect storm hit us on my fourth run down the alley. The featherweight only managed one garbled half of a distress call before it hit us. The fry computers went dead and the reactor powered down automatically. The drive, of course, was ripped right off its mounting. As far as anyone on our side of the hatch could tell, it had broken open. We hoped the radiation leak on the other side was serious enough to kill everyone in that compartment quickly and painlessly. The ship drifted to a stop. By cobbling together what working circuits we still had, we got one of the computers running again. They told us that we were still ten light years away from the nearest gravity well. On our maneuvering engines, even if we had fuel, it would take twenty years to reach whatever uninhabited planets awaited us there if there were any at all. We only had two weeks of rations left to eat. As you can probably tell already, I had spent a lot of time contemplating how awful a death in the alley could be. I spent even more time worrying about my creditor. With my pay from my first run with the featherweight, I brought a las gun. Not to point it at the loan shark. I never had a violent bone in my body, no. I bought it if the time ever came to put it to my head and pulled the trigger. On the crippled ship, it felt like the time had come. I retrieved the gun from my personal locker and was sitting on my bunk, turning it over. 
It seemed like a lot less suffering than slowly starving to death with no one to hear my cry for help. Or worse yet, to be forced to string out rations a few weeks longer with the flesh of my crewmates. The cold muzzle pressed against my temple. I swallowed. I felt the trigger click. I pulled the trigger again. And again, I looked the gun over. I saw the hole in the grip where the capacitor was supposed to be. In my haste to arm myself, I'd never bought one. My trembling claws threw the gun down in disgrace. I thought at that moment that there would be no saving me from the slow, terrifying death I dreamed. But right as I was about to burst into tears, the intercom crackled with hope. A ship called the Constellation was coming to save us from the other end of the Addy, the Terran End. Constellation was barely larger than our lifeboat, but it was much more zippy than the featherweight had ever claimed to be. Its crew of round-faced apes were all carrying smiles and no wolfish grins. Their doctor made sure to check each of us over with a dosimeter and set us up with an iodine to spare as the drive tunneled for the nearest station. I had a long chat with the captain. Constellation was no freighter. She was a ship built for one purpose. Life-saving. It made sense to me. If I was a bit greedier, I'd get into the life-saving business too. It made more money than shipping, that was for sure. But the human laughed at our captain when he tried to pay for the service that they rendered. This isn't a business transaction, he said. It is our duty. Of course, we still rewarded them out of our own pocket at the station's bar. Free drinks were the least that we could do for our gracious saviors. I stayed for a little while longer at the station before I found another freighter crew to join. One happy night at the bar was shattered by tragedy. Another massive storm had flared up in the alley, and a frantic voice notified us that Constellation and all of her hands had been swallowed up by the void. I've thought a lot about the good ship's fate ever since. Whether the storm tore the ship apart and the crew died quickly to radiation or exposure to vacuum. Whether she had gone as I feared I'd had. And her brave souls struggled on in starving bodies for a few weeks after the storm had passed. No matter how it happened, even when faced with the worst of fates... I'd like to think that the human I'd met died satisfied. After all, he told me he lived by the lifesaver's motto. You have to go out. You don't have to come back. End of story. Story number two. The Human I Knew. Written by Teller of Tall Tales. Many speak of humans as warlike species, chaotic, violent, disturbed. But few speak of their compassion and patience. The human I knew was a prime example of those two principles. I was in my middle decker cycles of life, a simple Castorian working in an intergalactic hospital cruiser. There was one human aboard that wasn't injured. His name was Dr. Samuel my mentor, and the head surgeon. A moment that comes to mind was when a young avian mechanic came into his ward. The poor sentient had been impaled after faulty repairs failed. Samuel held one of the avian's grasping claws as it screeched and babbled in its own language, translators unable to keep her. Gently, Dr. Samuel had reached out to me, requesting a small dose of sedative, which I administered all four arms working to hold the avian still. Samuel made a gentle whistling noise until the avian calmed down, staring at him. Switching to galactic standard, he stated, I'll be your surgeon. Close your eyes and count to ten. You'll be better when you reach zero, I promise. As the avian did so, Samuel silently pointed and ordered for a larger dose of sedative to put the avian under as he hooked up wires and pads to the avian. For the next full cycle, Samuel carefully removed the piece of metal. Crinkled brown eyes never shifted focus until, with a gentle lift from me, the piece of metal piping slid harmlessly out. 
As Samuel worked on the now visible damage, he did this for another full cycle, until, with the last bandage shrunk down to fit, he set his tools down and collapsed into a nearby chair, dark circles under his eyes. He smiled at the vitals registering stable on the hollow display and said, Well, Rex, uh, he's going to make it. Would you take over nursing duty while I go rest? I nodded once, and he smiled a bit wider, shuffling from the room. When the avian awoke, Samuel was there, holding its claws as it woke up. Its new translator made the next words clear. You didn't lie to me. Samuel chuckled and smiled. <laughs> I try to keep my promises. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click and click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to quickly thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Alithia, Barky, TryGen95, Beauticure, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholt, Jordan Bucksborn, Angry Marine, Albard and Gusta, Savage Patch Papa, and Arcadian. <laughs>